Okay, Gary, now it's up to you. You can uh, make this uh, screen, share screen, then full screen. Yeah, now, uh, hello, Gary. How are you? You are good. I'm good. Thank you. Yes, good. We are also good. We are very happy and appreciated uh, to be with you. Now, uh, with the Gary's per permission, I will give a very brief Turkish introduction. Uh, Gary Sik. E, Mayo Klinik'in, e, Mayo Klinik'te Department of Physiology ve Biomedical Engineering'in e, başkanı ve aynı zamanda e, investigator olarak çalışıyor kendisi. Kendisini uzun süre tanıtmama e, gerek yok. E, bu konuda dünya çapında en önemli uzmanlardan e, biri. Özellikle hava yolları, <gülüyor> e, düz kasları, smooth e, kaslar hücrelerinde çalışmalarıyla tanınmış. Hatta yani birazcık e, örnek vermek isterseniz stasyon sayısı 20 bine kadar ulaşmış. Çok gelişmiş, e, çok e, e, tanınmış bir uzman. E, bize bugün kendisi e, hava yolları inflamasyonlarının e, mitokondrial disfunction ve retikulum stres konusunda e, bir e, konferans verecek. E, sanırım e, bu e, COVID'in e, son günlerde COVID'e bağlı olarak, COVID pandemisine bağlı olarak akut e, hava yolları inflamasyonunun e, pro inflamatör stokinlerin etkisini yani e, araştıran bir konusu var. Kendisi bu konu aynı zamanda da e, büyük bir granta başvurmuş ve bu grantını da e, kazanmış ve bu konuda bize bu konuda aydınlatıcı bilgi verecek. Yes, now it's up to you, Gary. Uh, she is going to give us ever inflammation induced and the plasma reticulum stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. Okay, okay, Gary. All right, thank you, Mehmet. Welcome. I, I only wish I could be there right now. Uh, I've been to Turkey many, many times, and but uh, not not recently, and particularly in Istanbul. I love Istanbul. So I'm going to talk today about uh, some ongoing research in my lab that, that started uh, probably around 25 years ago. Um, and it relates to the impact of airway inflammation uh, on the properties of the airway smooth muscle. Now I can't advance, there we go. Uh, so I'm here at the Mayo Clinic. It's uh, one of the largest medical centers in the world It was uh, started, I don't know if you can see my pointer, by the original Dr. Mayo and, and his two sons and has evolved into a, a very, very large group practice that, that addresses uh, very acute uh, clinical problems. Uh, they're particularly noted for their surgeries um, and they, they really uh, take in patients that other physicians ha have not been able to help. The number of staff physicians is 4,500. And about uh, seven or 800 of those uh, are actively involved in research. We also have people like myself who are research scientists full time. We have about 230, 240 uh, research scientists. Uh, And Rochester, Mehmet's been to Rochester and he knows that almost all of Rochester are people that work at the Mayo Clinic. So there are about 40,000 people here in Rochester that, that come in daily and work here at, at Mayo. We see about 1.3 million patients per year. So that's about 3,600, 4,000 patients per day. Now we've been impacted by COVID, but we never shut down. We kept uh, the clinic open and things are really returning back to normal with the patient volume here at Mayo. We have about 130 uh, hospital admissions. I'm sitting here at St. Mary's Hospital, one of the two major hospitals. Uh, we have about 2,000 patient beds uh, here, and then we have a, another hospital uh, located about a mile away. Uh, we bring in about $11.2 billion worth of uh, medical business which makes us the largest employer in the entire state of Minnesota. And uh, uh, within that, we have about $750 million of research funding. So we do invest considerably in, into our research. Now, research at Mayo uh, actually was very, at the very beginning. Uh, the old man Mayo actually worked with uh, Dalton 
the famous physical chemist before he immigrated to the United States. And he, uh, he always was an adherent to the importance of science and medicine. William J. Mayo, the, one of the sons at the dedication of our Institute of Experimental Medicine, which was a precursor of the department that I'm in right now, said the research we do today will determine the type of medical and surgical practice which we carry on at the clinic tomorrow. And he, he actually meant that, that, that it's a major attractant to the Mayo Clinic. Patients come here because they think that their physicians are at the cutting edge of clinical practice. And this has become what we call a destination medical center. Uh, research instills the confidence, confidence and hope in our patients. When they come here, they think they're gonna be helped, even if their uh, conditions are a high acuity. It uh, provides a pathway for conquering disease. And of course, we advance medical science and technology through our research. This is nothing new. It was first uh, introduced by Claude Bernard, a French physician physiologist, who many consider the father of modern physiology and medicine. And in uh, 1865, he published this book, An Introduction to the Study of Experimental Medicine. And a, a, what he was promoting here was evidence-based medicine. And that's what we practice, that's what you practice in Turkey. The, the question or the, the comment that he made is that the experimenter who does not know what he is looking for will never understand what he finds. So it's very important to have a goal in your research and try to target what you're, you're looking for. What we're looking for is a better understanding the, of the pathophysiology of asthma and other respiratory diseases that affect the airways. Asthma is characterized by airway hyperreactivity and a remodeling of the airway with proliferation of cells within the airway. It impacts about 235 million people worldwide. I'm sure you have many asthmatic patients in Turkey. And this number is actually increasing, uh, both with global warming and with the pollution of our, our environment that's going on. It's triggered by the production of reactive oxygen species, most likely due to inflammation. And the, some of the downstream effects of of asthma are mediated by pro-inflammatory cytokines, mm -hmm. such as tumor necrosis factor alpha or TNF alpha. It's characterized by airway smooth muscle hyperactivity. We get a, a excessive constriction of the airways, shutting off the airflow to our lungs and remodeling of the airways with proliferation of cells and also of the cytoskeletal within cells. Now, what we noticed at the beginning of the COVID pandemic was that many of the characteristics of asthma also resemble the inflammation that occurs with uh, coronavirus infections. We again see the, the increase in reactive oxygen species, the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and downstream impact. And what I'm gonna talk about today is the impact of reactive oxygen species on protein damage and unfolding that triggers an unfolded protein res response or UPR, which we call an endoplasmic reticulum mm -hmm. uh, stress response because it occurs within the endoplasmic reticulum. There are th three sentinel proteins that are involved in this signaling pathway. Now this pathway exists for homeostatic purposes. We're constantly being exposed to uh, inflammatory mediators that, that trigger this restorative process, a regenerative process, is when this process get, gets out of control that uh, we run into problems. So the ER stress response, again, is triggered by reactive oxygen species and mediated by uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha. It leads to the misfolding or unfolding of, of proteins or frank damage of proteins and it triggers a response in one of these three pathways, the IRE1-alpha pathway, the PERC pathway, or the ATF6 pathway. Our studies have focused on the first pathway, the IRE1-alpha pathway, and I'll talk about that. We just published a paper uh, last year 
that show that only this pathway is activated by reactive oxygen species and TNF-alpha exposure. So uh, the ER stress pathway, again, is an accumulation of unfolded or misfolded proteins. It's also called the unfolded protein response. It's triggered by all sorts of physiological stressors, including the inflammation and the excessive production of reactive oxygen species. Uh, it's implicated in a number of diseases. So uh, we also have ongoing studies looking at neurodegenerative diseases and how this pathway might be involved and neurodegeneration. Uh, so it's included in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, various types of cancers. Uh, we think it's involved in asthma, and I want to propose today that it could also be involved in COVID. Some of the key questions we're posing, is there any evidence that, that uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines or reactive oxygen species induce this ER stress response? Does the ER stress response alter something else within the cells, uh, particularly mitochondrial structure and function. Mitochondria are the source of reactive oxygen species production within cells. So that could be one target. Uh, is it involved in the etiology of asthma and COVID? And does, it, uh, does targeting the ER stress pathway present a novel therapeutic uh, approach for treating asthma and COVID? So inflammation, uh, again, triggers both this hyperreactive condition and also a remodeling state. And these two things normally don't exist in, in parallel within cells. So cells are usually uh, either proliferative in nature or differentiated and contractile, particularly the airway smooth muscle cells. But here we have a condition where both things occur within uh, the airway smooth muscle. Uh, our hypothesis is that the pro-inflammatory cytokines mediate a hyperreactive response in airway smooth muscle, and I'll go into how that might occur. When we have a hyperreactive response, we produce more force, and with that, we consume more ATP and more oxygen. That increase in oxygen consumption has to be mediated by the mitochondria at the expense of reactive oxygen species formation and a vicious cycle that can result from that. To offset that, we propose that there's mitochondrial biogenesis as a normal homeostatic response that shares the load of oxygen consumption within the cells. And this triggers a proliferative response and re again, a homeostatic response within the airway. So uh, studies that we published uh, two years ago uh, were done by uh, uh, Marat Dogen. Uh, Marat came to us from Hashatepa uh, University uh, in Ankara and completed uh, almost uh, three years of postdoctoral training within the lab. Uh, he was uh, joined by Young Su Han and Philippe Delmont. Uh, Philippe is a research associate within the lab, and so is Young Su Han, who have been in the lab for almost 15 years. What they found was uh, in airway smooth muscle, we took out airway smooth muscle and made strips of airway smooth muscle so we could record the mechanical response to uh, stimulation by uh, muscarinic stimulation, acetylcholine at different concentrations of acetylcholine. And uh, the, the normal way you test for asthma, of course, is a cholinergic uh, response and you measure airway resistance changes uh, uh, with cholinergic stimulation. And uh, as you can see, with increasing concentrations of acetylcholine, there was increasing force responses. And the force response in the TNF-alpha are the top responses compared to control untreated responses. And here the, the, uh, the strips were exposed to TNF-alpha for 24 hours. And you can see after 24 hour exposure, there was a dramatic increase in the overall force response. When we did the, the concentration dependency of that force response, we also show, saw a shift in the effective concentration to produce 50% response. So the, the uh, airway smooth muscle became hyperreactive to acetylcholine stimulation. And as shown down below, the, the maximum response increased 
and the EC50 or AD50 decreased after exposure to TNF-alpha. Uh, now, there are a couple of things that could account for that increase in force response. Uh, we've uh, just published a paper looking at calcium sensitivity, and there's a, there is an increase in calcium sensitivity, but that can't explain the entire response. Most of the uh, increase in force response is due to an increase in the contractile protein expression within cells. Now, this is occurring within 24 hours and actually even a shorter period than that, because there can be polymerization of, of both actin and, and myosin within the airway smooth muscle. So the increase in force response is attributed mostly to an increase in the number of contractile units contributing to that force response. Now with an increase in force response, there's also an increase in ATP consumption. This is work that, that was done uh, more than 20 years ago by Keith Anthony Jones, Tony Jones, who is now chair of anesthesiology and chief physician at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and Young Su Han, who was just completing his doctoral work at that time within the lab. We used this system where we could take very small strips of airway smooth muscle, permeabilize the smooth muscle, expose that to various concentrations of calcium, to activate here uh, the smooth muscle with calcium. And at that time, we could also uh, use a technique to measure the ATP consumption rate, where by in a closed system, when ATP is consumed, it produces, of course, ADP and inorganic phosphate. The ADP can be reconstituted to uh, ATP by reaction with phenol, uh, enol, uh, phosphoenolpyruvate to form ATP plus uh, pyruvate. The pyruvate with NADH forms lactate and NAD. The NADH is highly fluorescent, the NAD isn't. So as we consume ATP, there's an extinction of the NADH fluorescence. So we stop flow in the cuvette, measure the extinction of the NADH signal, and that gives us a measurement of ATP consumption. Then we reintroduce flow to the cuvette then stop flow again and, and repeat, repeat. And by doing this, every 15 seconds, we get a measurement of ATP consumption during force development. And we found, of course, that the ATP hydrolysis rate uh, is correlated very strongly with the force generation. That's not surprising, but we had to confirm that. Now, uh, what Marat uh, did in a more recent study of uh, was to look at the impact of TNF-alpha exposure for 24 hours on force generation. Uh, this is at the, the EC50 of muscarinic stimulation. Well, actually, this I'm sorry, this is calcium activation, sorry. Maximum calcium activation. And he found, as we had found before, that there's an increase in the force response. This is in permeabilized cells. Then we measured the ATP consumption rate, and you can see there, is a very marked increase in ATP consumption rate that occurs within these cells. The ATP consumption goes to a peak and then falls again to a plateau. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. That's evidence for internal loading uh, of the contractile units within airway smooth muscle. So there is an increase in ATP hydrolysis rate after TNF-alpha exposure. And with that, an increase in force, both together led to an increased tension costs in terms of how much ATP consume is consumed per unit of force production within the airway smooth muscle. So the muscle is becoming far less efficient because of TNF-alpha exposure. Now, uh, the model that we're working with uh, involves two actual steps for the production of force within airway smooth muscle. The canonical pathway that most of us read about in textbooks is calcium binds to calmodulin. It activates the myosin light chain kinase that mediates phosphorylation of a regulatory my myosin light chain that allows the 
formation of cross bridges within airway smooth muscle. And that's also regulated by a phosphatase that again regulates the extent of myosin lichen phosphorylation. Again, this is the textbook version. We've looked at the delays involved in this kind of pathway and, and there are approximately one second delay before you see a response. We also see evidence for uh, polymerization of both actin and myosin within the airway and the formation of new contractile units. So it's de novo production of, of contractile proteins plus the polymerization and formation of contractile units. The delay here is much longer. So it takes about 60 seconds for that to occur uh, within airway smooth muscle. Finally, there's a delay that's introduced because the actin filaments need to attach to the, the uh, cortical cytoskeleton of the airway smooth muscle in order to translate the force to the outside, to the extracellular matrix. And this tethering again requires time and that delay is on the order of two to four minutes. Now, most of the impact of pro-inflammatory cytokines, we see very little impact on this pathway, the canonical myosin light chain phosphorylation pathway. We see all of the effects on these other pathways for the addition of contractile units and also for the cytoskeletal remodeling effects and the tethering uh, to the cortical cytoskeleton. Now for this talk, what's important is the increase in ATP hydrolysis that occurs. When there's an increase in ATP hydrolysis, there, there's of course an increase in ADP concentration. And that impacts uh, mitochondrial function through the ATP synthase, which is stimulated by an increase in the ADP ATP ratio. So as the ATP hydrolysis increases, ATP concentration increases, and there's a stimulation of ATP synthase and the production of ATP. Uh, we call that uh, excitation energy coupling that's occurring. On the other side, with excitation, there's an increase, a transient increase in cytoskeletal, I mean, uh, cytosolic calcium. And with that, through a linkage to the mitocalcium uh, mitochondrial calcium uniporter, there's an increase in uh, calcium concentration within mitochondria to stimulate the TCA cycle. Uh, there are a couple of dehydrogenases that are, are calcium sensitive. And this of course feeds the electron transport chain and stimulates O2 consumption through the electron transport chain. So these are finely uh, coupled reactions uh, that typically, typically occur within mitochondria to match the increase in, in uh, energy requirements with energy production. So uh, we looked at what happens uh, with TF-alpha exposure in terms of reactive oxygen species formation, very specifically superoxide anion. We approach this in two ways. We use mitosox in one case and then an HPLC uh, technique to look at superoxide uh, production as well. And what we found is that within hours of TNF alpha exposure, uh, we start seeing an increase in reactive oxygen species formation. Uh, what we're looking at now is this, the source of this reactive oxygen species. We're, we're not quite sure where this comes from. It could, uh, we're not uh, involving here uh, immune cells because these are isolated airway smooth muscle cells. So it is intrinsic production. We think it is uh, due to at least in part to mitochondrial production of reactive oxygen species, but it could also be uh, due to other sources. So with the uh, increase in reactive oxygen species formation, we trigger uh, the unfolded protein response. Uh, what is actually happening uh, is that with the unfolding of proteins, uh, chaperone proteins, uh, uh, GRP78 or BIP is dissociated from uh, the IRE1 alpha and binds to the unfolded proteins. And the removal of the chaperone protein from the IRE1 alpha triggers autophosphorylation of IRE1 alpha. The phosphorylation of IRE1 alpha 
then leads to the alternative splicing of the X box protein, a transcription factor that then mediates transcription of downstream target proteins. And uh, the proteins we're gonna concentrate on are those that involve mitochondrial remodeling. So this is a pathway we're interested in. And uh, two years ago, we did a study to explore this and we found that um, with TNF alpha exposure in the dark red, as compared to cells that were not exposed to TNF alpha for 24 hours, or for a period going into 24 hours, uh, we saw uh, phosphorylation of the RE1 alpha. Now we also have, uh, these are human airway smooth muscle cells that we harvest from uh, surgical biopsies. Uh, these are patients that we know the, the histories of these patients. They either have a history of asthma or they don't have a history of, of asthma. They have other, no other pathologies. They're typically in here for uh, cancer resections, lung resections. And the surgeons take areas of lung that are, are pathogens or, or uh, non-pathological as well. Um, and we, we harvest the tissue from this unaffected region of, of the airways. We dissect uh, the, the small bronchial airways and then we dissociate uh, air, airway smooth muscle cells from these human biopsies. Uh, we then passage the cells no more than three passages. So uh, we've seen before that if we go beyond three passages that they undifferentiate. And so we restrict our analysis to uh, one to three passages of these primary airway smooth muscle cells. They're divided into two groups, um, actually four groups here, either control or treated with TNF alpha. And we, the control have no history of asthma. The asthmatic, of course, have a history of either uh, moderate to mild uh, asthma. So we have excluded the severe asthmatic group here. What we see is that uh, with TNF alpha exposure, we start to see an increase in phosphorylation of RE1 alpha even after one hour. This peaks after about 12 hours and then decreases again uh, after 24 hours. In our asthmatic uh, airway smooth muscle cells, we saw an exaggerated response, an exaggeration of this phosphorylation of, of uh, RE1 alpha. We also looked at uh, splicing of Xbox protein. We can do this one of two ways, either through mRNA or actual protein expression. And we compare the amount of splice versus unsplice Xbox protein. Again, dividing the group into two groups, uh, either control untreated with TNF alpha or treated with TNF alpha, and then normal versus asthmatic airway smooth muscle cells. And in the dark red, you can see the response of normal airway smooth muscle cells. There is a, an increase in the amount of spliced Xbox protein. Now this is downstream to IRE1 alpha. And in the asthmatic, this was exaggerated even at the beginning after, before treatment, there was a, a greater amount of spliced Xbox protein. And this increased even further with uh, acute exposure to TNF alpha. Now, what we think is happening is, is our effects of this pathway on downstream uh, targets. Uh, one that I'll talk about later is PGC1 alpha, which mediates uh, remodeling of mitochondria. But uh, we were also interested in uh, mitochondrial fragmentation that occurs within airway smooth muscle. We had noted before that mitochondria become fragmented. We've, we've done that both by electron microscopic analysis, but also using confocal imaging that I'll show you in a second. And we saw an increase in fragmentation of mitochondria. Uh, they were not filamentous or elongated uh, compared to normal. And so we uh, wanted to look at two proteins that are involved in dynamic remodeling of mitochondria. Mitofusin 2, 
which with its partner mitofusin one is responsible for the fusion of mitochondria, the elongation of mitochondria. It's also involved in the fusion of mitochondria to the endoplasmic reticulum. And I'll talk about that in a second. Another protein that we're interested in is dynamin related po uh, protein DRP1, uh, which when it's phosphorylated triggers the, the fission or the fragmentation of mitochondria. And so uh, we look at both the increase in overall DRP1 expression, but also phosphorylation of DRP1. With uh, TNF alpha exposure in the controls, we saw a decrease in uh, the mitofusin 2 uh, levels within airway smooth muscle and an increase in DRP1. In the control asthmatics, even in steady state, there was a higher level or lower level of mitofusin 2 and a higher level of DRP1. And that reduced even further with TNF alpha in the case of mitofusin 2 or increased even further with respect to DRP1. Now, as I, I mentioned, uh, what triggered this analysis was this very obvious fragmentation of mitochondria that we noted. Now, these mitochondria have been labeled with mitotracker green. Mitotracker green gets distributed across the mitochondrial membrane uh, based on the proton gradient. If there's a mitochondrial membrane potential, then mitotracker green will distribute based on that, that membrane potential. And we can use this to visualize mitochondria within the airway smooth muscle. Uh, we use uh, confocal microscopy. Uh, this is using a very high numerical aperture uh, objective so that our spatial resolution is, is very good. We get about 250 nanometer spatial resolution. We increase that even further uh, by deconvolution of the images so that we can get a spatial rev resolution of about 1.25, 125 nanometers. Uh, so we can visualize the mitochondria. We, we do optical slicing so we can reconstruct the mitochondria in three dimensions within the airway smooth muscle. Uh, by doing that, we can then do morphometric analysis and we, we have calculated two uh, parameters that tell us something about uh, how fragmented or elongated the mitochondria are, how filamentous or fragmented. A form factor, which is uh, perimeter squared over four pi, uh, the area of mitochondria, and aspect ratio, which was a, a metric of mitochondrial length, the major uh, axis over the minor axis. Uh, both of these give us a measure of how elongated or fragmented the mitochondria are. So this is the change in form factor that, that we found. Uh, in airway smooth muscle, you can see here, the form factor uh, was reduced with TNF alpha. So they became more fragmented with TNF alpha exposure. This is 24 hours. If we treat with uh, a reactive oxygen species scavenger, Temple, we could completely mitigate that effect on mitochondria. In these airway smooth muscle cells, we also could overexpress mitofusin 2. Uh, and by overexpressing mitofusin 2, we could also mitigate and actually lead to further elongation of mitochondria within airway smooth muscle cells. Uh, if we decrease mitofusin 2 expression apart from TNF alpha by using an siRNA, we could mimic the effects of TNF alpha. Uh, this is compared to a nonsense siRNA that had uh, no significant effects. When we overexpress mitofusin 2 and also treated with TNF alpha, we again mitigated the effect of TNF alpha. And finally, we used a, uh, a um, chaperone protein to try to, to stop this unfolded protein response at the very onset. And again, we could mitigate the effects of TNF-alpha uh, using a, uh, a chaperone protein treatment. 
So this uh, presented uh, different ways that we could therapeutically target this impact on the ER stress response. We could use antioxidants such as tempo or mitotempo or other antioxidants to try to mitigate the production of reactive oxygen species. We could use the treatment with chemical chaperones such as PBA, which is sodium 4 butyrate and again, try to prevent the autophosphorylation of the IRE1 alpha, so mitigate the unfolding of proteins. Uh, but beyond this, uh, we could try to overexpress mitofusin 2. Now, uh, this kind of gene therapy approach uh, has never panned out, uh, and so th that is not our first choice. It's an experimental tool, however, for us. And when we use these various uh, approaches, looking at IRE1 uh, phosphorylation, we again saw with TNF-alpha, there's an increase in IRE1-alpha phosphorylation triggering this ER stress response. If we use chaperone proteins, PBA, we could mitigate that TNF-alpha effect on IRE1-alpha phosphorylation. We could also do it with TEMPO by antioxidant treatment. In asthmatics, the extent of IRE1 alpha phosphorylation was even greater. And we could mitigate that to some extent with a chaperone protein treatment. So this uh, presents potential therapeutic targets to, to uh, treat the, at least the acute exposure or acute inflammatory response uh, triggered by re either reactive oxygen species or by pro-inflammatory cytokines. The use of antioxidants uh, which has its drawbacks because uh, reactive oxygen species signaling is important in cells, but also chemical chaperone treatment uh, that could be used. Now, uh, we are particularly interested in the downstream impacts on mitochondrial remodeling. I, in all of our studies, uh, we use tunica myosin as a nonspecific uh, trigger of of ER stress responses. Tunicomycin actually activates all three signaling pathways. And uh, what we found was that with tunicomycin, mitofusin II expression does decrease. And that is very similar to the effects of TNF-alpha. The difference between the two is TNF-alpha uh, mediates only RE1-alpha activation tunicomycin activates all three pathways. This suggests to us that, that the RE1-alpha pathway is the predominant pathway for, this, for the effects that we've been looking at. With uh, tunicomycin, if we treat with chaperone protein treatment, we do mitigate the, the effects of tunicomycin. We prevent the activation of the ER stress pathways. We can do the same uh, with uh, antioxidant treatment with TNF-alpha or with chaperone pro protein uh, treatment. So again, both are effective, effective in preventing this downstream impact on mitofusin II expression. Uh, experimentally, we, we've tried other approaches. Uh, we're able to transfect the human airway smooth muscle cells with a non-phosphorylatable IRE1-alpha. And so in green uh, uh, is the expression of the non-phosphorylatable IRE1-alpha. And if we transfect the cells with the, this non-phosphorylatable IRE1-alpha, we'd have no impact on mitofusin II expression. In the non-transfected -trans cells, again, no expression of the unphosphorylatable IRE1-alpha, we markedly reduce uh, the expression of mitofusin II. So here we're looking at, at the mRNA expression. Uh, to measure this, we're using uh, a technique called RNA scope, where it's an in situ hybridization technique where we can actually look at the expression of, my, of mRNA uh, within cells. And the mRNA expression in terms of fluorescent units or dots per cell uh, 
uh, was decreased with TNF-alpha exposure, so a reduction in myofusin 2 gene expression. And this occurred six hours after TNF-alpha exposure. We start to see this actually after three hours of TNF-alpha exposure. And uh, when we transfect the cells with a non-phosphorylatable IRUN-alpha, we see no impact on myofusin 2 mRNA expression of the transfection itself, and we completely mitigate the impact of TNF-alpha exposure on mitofusin 2 expression. So we can stop the effect of, on mitofusin 2 expression if we prevent activation of this IRE1-alpha pathway. Uh, we have done the same thing uh, using a very similar approach, but we now transfect the cells with a non-phosphorylatable, I mean a non-spliceable Xbox protein. So uh, when we transfect the cells with a non-spliceable Xbox protein, we can completely mitigate the effects of TNF-alpha on mitofusin 2 expression. Now this is downstream of IRE1-alpha. And if we treat with TNF-alpha, we have no impact on mitofusin 2 expression. In fact, we see a, an actual increase in mitofusin 2. Now, uh, one of the impacts of mitofusin 2, in addition to uh, remodeling of mitochondria, it's very important in tethering uh, mitochondria uh, to the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. So the membranes actually become tethered to each other. And this occurs close to the uh, mitochondrial calcium uniporter for calcium influx uh, into the mitochondria. Mitofusin 2 uh, forms a, a dimer either with another mitofusin 2 on uh, the ER membrane or with mitofusin 1. So it can be a mitofusin 2, mitofusin 2, or mitofusin 2, mitofusin 1 tethering. Mitofusin 2 is, is located both within mitochondria but also within the cytosol. Now, uh, we uh, were impressed with, with work uh, by others that had looked at the formation of, of this close association between mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum mediated through the mitofusins. And this uh, led to the formulation of a theory called the hotspot theory, that this tethering of mitofusin 2 with mitofusin 1 or mitofusin 2 and mitofusin 2 is necessary to bring the sarcoplasmic reticulum close to the calcium uniporter, su such that calcium release into the cytosol there is a much higher concentration. And that will then activate the calcium uniporter to allow calcium influx. Now, calcium influx through this calcium uniporter is activated by calcium itself. But it's only activated at fairly high concentrations of cytosolic calcium in excess of two micromolar. The normal global calcium levels within the cytosol, even during uh, maximum excitation, uh, approaches one micromolar, but doesn't exceed one micromolar. Now that's the global calcium, and that's what we've measured in human airway smooth muscle cells. Uh, but in at the source of the calcium efflux from mitochondria, either at ryanodine receptors or IP3 receptors, the calcium concentration is much, much higher and it starts to approach uh, five to 10 micromolar. So these are sites of ER you know, calcium release or hot spots of higher calcium concentration that activate the calcium uniporter. We think that during activation, this tethering of the SR to the mitochondria is important to have calcium influx that then affects proteases, I mean, um, hydrolases within the Krebs cycle or TCA cycle that increases proton expression, or proton production, uh, and feeds the electron transport chain. So you get an increase in 
in electron transport and O2 consumption that matches the excitation that will occur of contraction. And you also stimulate ADP uh, mediated ATP synthase. So the two sides of the mitochondria are, are coupled in this respect. Now we looked, we've looked at uh, the tethering of mitochondria to the endoplasmic reticulum in various ways. Uh, in this case, we, we labeled the mitochondria and labeled the endoplasmic or sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then using our high resolution confocal imaging, looked at the extent of overlap uh, using the Mander's overlap coefficient. And with this, we saw that with TNF alpha, the extent of overlap actually decreased uh, with TNF alpha exposure. Again, consistent with the reduction in mitofusin II uh, production. We've also measured uh, calcium using our, uh, again, a high resolution imaging system. We measure cytosolic calcium uh, with flow three, and that's shown in the green. And then simultaneously measured mitochondrial calcium levels using rod two, shown in the red. I hope you can see that the mitochondrial calcium is delayed slightly from the cytosolic calcium. So you have an increase in cytosolic calcium and then with a slight delay, an increase in mitochondrial calcium. We've looked at the peak amplitude of these responses. Uh, with TNF alpha, there's actually an increase in the amplitude of the cytosolic calcium re response, uh, and, but a decrease after TNF alpha in the mitochondrial calcium response. So you see an exaggeration of the, the two responses. Uh, since we're uh, imaging with high resolution, we could also image, and again, uh, high spatial and temporal resolution, we could look at the rate of calcium influx in the change in nanomolar change in calcium per second. And under controlled conditions, the rate of mitochondrial calcium influx was about 80 nanomoles of calcium per second. With TNF alpha, that rate of calcium influx was actually slow uh, due to the fact that uh, the calcium uniporter is not as activated. So not only do we see an effect on the ATP synthase side of mitochondria, we see an effect on the calcium influx side of mitochondria that would result in a decrease in mitochondrial calcium, less stimulation of the TCA cycle uh, and proton production and then a, an effect on mitochondrial membrane potential. Now, uh, we're currently looking at using TMRM imaging to look at mitochondrial membrane potential and, and changes here. We do see a, a decrease in overall mitochondrial membrane potential after TNF alpha exposure, which would be consistent with this impact. Now, we've also measured O2 consumption using a seahorse technique. And with, with the seahorse, uh, we use a, a stress test to look at various aspects of mitochondrial function. Uh, most relevant here is FCCP, which is a uh, uh, ionophore that affects the proton gradient within uh, mitochondria. So it completely disrupts that proton gradient and then uncouples uh, O2 consumption with proton uh, gradient, and you get a maximum O2 consumption that occurs after FCCP. Uh, then we use retinon and endomyosin, which inhibit complex one and complex three of the electron transport chain. <coughs> so that's upstream to uh, O2 consumption. And we see a, a marked decrease in O2 consumption that results there. So the combination of SCCP to get maximum and then retinon and endomyosin to get a minimum value gives you the maximum respiratory capacity or maximum respiration. Uh, we looked at maximum respiration within airway smooth muscle cells. Uh, and we saw that the uh, maximum respiration uh, 
if it's not normalized for the mitochondrial volume density of the within the airway smooth muscle cells, the maximum respiration actually increases. But what we noted was that there's a marked increase in mitochondrial volume density. And when we normalize for the increased amount of mitochondria, the O2 consumption per mitochondrial volume actually decreases, as does ATP production and basal respiration. Uh, we think that uh, that what, what's involved is that with TNF alpha exposure, uh, one of the downstream targets of the IRE one alpha pathway is PGC one alpha, which leads to the the uh, biogenesis of mitochondria within airway smooth muscle to to offset the uh, O2 consumption demand per mitochondria. So as a result, after 24 hours, we see a, an increase in mitochondrial volume density. Uh, this is using our imaging technique. We also, consistent with that, see an increase in porin. Porin is a, a mitochondrial protein, and we see an increase in porin expression within airway smooth muscle. We've measured uh, biogenesis uh, by looking at DNA, mitochondrial DNA copy number in two different ways. And again, with TNF alpha exposure, we see an increase in mitochondrial uh, copy number, which is a marker of mitochondrial biogenesis. So uh, this is a very complex slide, but this is a very complex uh, pathway that we're exploring. We, we think that with uh, inflammation and production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and or the production of reactive oxygen species, you get two effects. One is to increase contractile proteins, increase force, increase ATP consumption and oxygen consumption within airway smooth muscle, which has an impact on mitochondrial ATP production through ATP synthase. The second pathway is triggered by the unfolding of proteins, and that triggers an ER stress pathway that activates phosphorylation of, of IRE1-alpha. The splicing of Xbox protein, this transcription factor, then leads to an increased production of PGC1-alpha. Uh, downstream to that, we think that there's a decrease in mitofusin-1 and an increase in DRP1 that leads to mitochondrial fragmentation. The PGC1-alpha also increases mitochondrial biogenesis. Another thing I haven't talked about is mitophagy uh, that's triggered by uh, this pathway as well with an increase in pink and Parkin expression. This all leads to a remodeling of mitochondria uh, to increase the volume density of mitochondria to share the load, the mitochondrial O2 consumption load, and by doing that to lessen the production of reactive oxygen species. So we think this is a normal homeostatic response within airway smooth muscle, as well as with other cell types, that if it doesn't mediate the right effect, if it's dysfunctional, will lead to a pathology. And we think that with asthma and as well as COVID infection, that there is an underlying pathology that leads to either an exaggerated ear stress response or one that is ineffective in, in mitigating the, the impact of reactive oxygen species formation. Now, I always end my talks with this quote from our famous author, Mark Twain. So th what he said is that there's no such thing as a new idea. It's impossible. We simply take a lot of old ideas put them together in, into sort of a mental kaleidoscope. We give them a turn and they make new and curious combinations. So everything I've talked about today isn't particularly innovative. It's been explored in other cell types and by other investigators. And what we've done is simply borrow from their previous investigations and then apply this to airway smooth muscle and to the pathology that occurs with asthma and COVID infection. Now, I am, what, my only real talent is that I surround myself uh, with extremely bright, 
uh, generally younger people who do all the work uh, within the lab. And because of this, I've been able to attract a large amount of extramural funding from our National Institutes of Health. From the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, six separate grants from uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood, and two grants from our National Institute of Aging. And in particular, uh, for the this work on airway smooth muscle, I want to point out uh, the work of uh, Marat Dogen, who I've mentioned before, uh, John Yap, who was in my lab uh, beginning as a high school student, then as an undergraduate, and he's now an MD PhD student at Loyola Un University in Chicago. Young Su Han, who got his PhD working in the lab, and F Philippe Delmotte, who's from France and has been a research associate in the lab for a number of years. Of course, we had the help of a lot of other people uh, within the lab as well. All right, I hope I left some time or very little time for questions. Mehmet Hocam, mikrofonunuz kapalı. Uh, thank you very much, Gary, for this valuable conference. It's magnificent and about airway inflammation induced endoplasmic stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. Because there is uh, not much participant, uh, we can only, if there's a question, we can take them by uh, here, not sure. uh, written. Is there a question? Um, Abdullah Hoca, do you have a question about yes. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Giri, for this great presentation and your findings and your studies. So I'd like to ask if you have been uh, an interest so far about peptidyl uh, proline uh, isomerase enzymes and uh, on their role in uh, smooth muscle sensitivity in the airways or unfolded protein response. Would you like to make any comment about it? Uh, well, we haven't focused on that at all, but I think it's a very interesting area to move into. And, um, it would lend itself to some of the tools that we have available within the lab. Okay. But, uh, there's so many different areas to, to move into. Uh, we, we've spent the last uh, almost 10 years working on this area. Uh, and to drill down like we need to in basic science, we can't explore everything. Okay. Thank you very much. Great sure. job. I think. Uh, is there, is there may I ask one question? <laughs> yes, please, Yelda. Uh, yes. First yes. of all, I would like to thank you, Professor uh, Gary. It was a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I would like to ask one question about uh, Have you ever considered mitochondrial super complexes during your uh, works? Uh, I missed the. the have we ever done what? Mitochondrial super complexes. Have you ever checked? Mitochondrial super complexes? Yes, respirosome, or we can call it. Yeah, uh, well, we, we can't identify them, number one, within cells. So that, that makes it a little more difficult. Um, we certainly think that, that mitochondria remodeling isn't always just fragmentation of mitochondria, so that there can be other changes within mitochondria. Uh, we're very interested in, in uh, validating and perfecting our techniques to look at mitochondrial membrane potential, because we think we could get out uh, many of the questions like this uh, if we're able to actually look at the functional state of mitochondria uh, at the membrane potential level. Thank so you. again, in the future, we possibly could explore this. It should be reflected by changes in mitochondrial membrane potential. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I think so. Uh, Gary, what, thank you very much for meeting. Uh, when I was here, I'm just saying there's only 32,000 employees. Now it increased to 40,000, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Ten years is that eight thousand. So that's so. And Rochester is growing uh, every day. So, yes, growing every day. Yes, Rochester is growing. So, can you anything about the uh, 
speed of the mitochondria. When I was here, you were measuring the speed of the mitochondria. And yeah. Philippe Del Motto was here. I saw his yeah. old. So you can tell my best wish to him. And sure. Yes. Do you think anything about the speed of the my, mitochondria? Yeah, no, no I, didn't, I didn't go into that at all. So we, with our imaging system, because we, we do image at um, high resolution temporally and spatially, we can look at mitochondrial movement. Yes. And we can capture in real time uh, the, the splitting or fragmentation, the, the fission of mitochondria. Um, we were particularly interested in two groups of mitochondria, those that surround the nucleus uh, and those that are more uh, distal uh, uh, within the airway smooth muscle cells. These smooth muscle cells are spindle shaped. Yes. And so we do have mitochondria in the more uh, tips of the, of the uh, airway smooth muscle. The uh, velocity of movement we define two, two different types of movement. Uh, one is um, directed movement. So it's moving in a, in a uh, defined pathway. And we think that that's mediated through cytoskeletal proteins and, and movement along the cytoskeletal. Um, but we also see that mitochondria uh, sit and have a kinetic motion uh, particularly around the, the nucleus. And uh, we think we can capture the, the rate of oscillation of the mitochondria around the nucleus. I, we have no idea how this is important, but we do see changes that are induced. Uh, so when we've used TNF-alpha exposure, for example, we, we impact the velocity of movement and I think that's what you're, you're, you're getting to. Uh, we published that about four years ago or five years ago now. So maybe you, you were here when we were doing this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is there anybody questions? Anyone? Okay, thank you very much. Hope to see you in our laboratory or we can make some joint project with your laboratory and in. To yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. I'd like to see you in person rather than uh, by yeah. Zoom. Yes, okay, nice to see you. All right. Okay, see you. Time is thank you very much. Yes, we are also thank you very much. I appreciate it to be with you even in the Zoom. Okay, uh -huh. bye. Bye bye. Thank bye. you.